we're going to introduce to you, for the first time, our 2023 inductees for the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame. And uh, for the first time in the history of the Hall of Fame, we're going to induct a brother and a sister. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Yep. Uh, Richard DeWitt and Jackie DeWitt Rowland were both uh, awesome, awesome racers back then in the early mid 70s. And uh, she won a World Series. And Dickie won three World Series in a row. Yeah. That's impressive. And uh, unfortunately, the family lost Dick at a very early age. He was only 17 years old, and, and uh, he was involved in a bad car accident and was killed. Wow. And he was on his way to probably become another Brad Hulings or Herb Yancey. The kid was just awesome. Wow. And uh, but they they were both uh, they were both uh, awesome drivers back then. It was a, a independent team, family family run team, and uh, uh, big big names back then. The DeWitts. So uh, that's our first inductee, going by alphabetical order, and our next one is Richard DeSantis. Big name back then, Richard DeSantis. I won't go over uh, details on their resumes. You will be able to go to Crane Snowmobile Museum uh, site online, and they will be in there, and you can read all about each one's resume. That was Richard DeSantis. All good-looking kids, too, don't you think? They yeah. Did. Had some beautiful... Yeah, they had everything going They had on. everything going. They had the talent. They had the looks. Yes. And uh, here's Frank Dodge. Uh, Frank is a local racer from Littleton, New Hampshire. Uh, and so uh, he raced for Timberland Machines back in the day. And uh, he's New Hampshire's only number one bib holder during the golden era. Wow. Frank had number one bib for... Uh, 1973. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, or 70, it was just 73 or 74, I can't remember now, but anyway, uh, I love to read it. And uh, I'm the one that wrote up the recipe. Huh. So, but go online on Crane Snowmobile Museum, and you can, uh, you can read all these guys' resumes. And, uh, but Frank was certainly one of the top drivers back then, and another Timberland Machines uh, member on the wall. And, uh, finally, we have Everett Regal, and uh, Everett uh, is uh, probably in the top 2% on everybody's short list of uh, engine geniuses back in the day. He, uh, he made it, he, he did things with two cycle engines that people didn't think was possible. And uh, he had uh, the team called the Widowmakers, and uh, Kenny uh, Young was one of the team members, and so was Chip Elwood, was on the... Uh, the Widowmakers team, and uh, they did extremely well back then, and uh, a lot of it was due to uh, Everett Regal's ingenious uh, methods of making those two strokes go faster than anybody else, so there's Everett. Nice. Yeah. So there you have it, folks. There's your five 2023 inductees. You'll see more, hear more about it in the future, and we'll have our induction next September uh, for an outdoor ceremony, September 10th. Uh, no, excuse me, September 9th. 9th. Yeah, this last year was 10. September 9th, Saturday, usually start around 1.30, 1, 1.30. And uh, if you want to come to that, you will see a lot of uh, the uh, older members that are already on the wall and be able to shake their hands and talk to them. And uh, these, are the, these are the guys that we used to look up to. These, us, you know, us New, let's face it, us New England kids didn't have any big sports figures uh, coming to Lancaster or any of these small towns. These guys did. You know, you know, you can watch Richard Petty race at Daytona on television on ABC Wide World of Sports. Uh, you can, you know, watch uh, the basketball players, the hockey players on television from Boston and New York. And uh, but none of those guys ever came to Lancaster. True. These these guys came, most of them, or Boonville, New York, or Bangor, Maine. Yeah. And uh, they signed your autographs, and uh, they thought we'd forgotten them, but. Uh, yeah, fine enough, we didn't. Yeah. yeah, and if I can add to that, going into our seventh year with this Hall of Fame reunion, or, or sorry, Hall of Fame induction ceremony, Yeah. this has turned into a reunion 
for yeah. anyone who's associated with or interested in Eastern racing, Eastern snowmobile racing. That, that family reunion. Yeah, right. inductees, past, present, and future show up, and anyone interested or have memories yeah. of this. Uh, it's turned into a reunion kind of a situation. So it's yeah. it's wonderful to see these awards given out. They're certainly worthy of them, and it's a wonderful thing. But the other byproduct of this that maybe we no one had anticipated is that it's a wonderful reunion. It's a community, it and we all have a wonderful time visiting and sharing stories and laughing. Yeah. It's yeah. it's a very jovial uh, time, and uh, it's yeah. if, if you're interested in this sort of thing, it's something you don't want to miss. Uh, this is something that you need to really soak right up uh, uh, now, too, because these people are in their mid-70s, early 80s now. Yes, the clock is ticking. Uh, if you miss any of these inductions now, you may not see these guys again, really. Uh, I hate to say it, but uh, we've lost a couple now already. Uh, and uh, so if, if you watch these guys when you were kids, uh, 20-somethings, teenagers, and uh, they're in the flesh. They're right here. They're at Cranes every fall for these inductions. Yeah. And, you know, you stand back and you listen to these guys talking amongst you know each other and talking racing and, and, uh, and the one that they missed and... Uh, you know the, the the accident and the guy pushed him off the track and uh, they're laughing about it now because uh, yeah. you know it's, it's part of the history and uh, it's just a it's a family reunion. Mike was right. It's not. It's more than an induction. It's a family reunion. Yeah. So, uh, and yeah. I think the bonds grow deeper with every every passing year. Yeah. Because yeah. we all get to know each other better and we look forward to seeing right. each other and it's like seeing old friends. It really is a reunion. It is. It yeah. is. And you know social media. Uh, say what you want about social media. I know there's uh, there's a lot of things wrong with social media, but the things that are right about it is these folks are now being able to connect with each other on a daily basis. Yeah. On the Hall of Fame Facebook, on, on the Hall of Fame Facebook group is a wonderful place where people can reconnect. Wonderful place. People are finding each other. That They're finding been, old photos. Yeah. They, they haven't they seen, seen each other in 50 plus years and yeah. they're finding each other. And, they are. And, uh, and it's, it's an amazing uh, thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to be a part of that, um, it's, it's something pretty special as far as I'm concerned. So It is. And the, the atmosphere or the vibe, if you will, at the, the ceremony is very laid back and very intimate. So you can approach these people and say hi and ask them questions, get a photo taken. Um, you know, it's it's yeah. it's not like they're on this high pedestal and you're down below and yeah. they're not accessible yeah. to you. Yeah. You know, you can mix and mingle and visit with them. And, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah it's if wonderful. you have an old photo of them uh, that you need, a, you know, uh, need them to sign, uh, you bring a Sharpie and, and these people are, you know, you know willing and uh, to sign any autographs for you and, and to stand there and visit with you and uh, it's all personable and yeah. it's, it's just a, it's a great little event. Yeah, and yeah. one other thing to add, if you're planning to drive from any distance to attend this, the place to stay is the Lancaster, Lancaster Motel. Motel. Yeah, and yeah. I, st I stayed there last night. I can personally vouch yeah, yeah. for the quality experience that, that yeah. it is to stay there. Yeah, it's, a, it's an Art Deco 1950s motel. Yeah. Uh, the Berriman family has kept it that way. They uh, purposely uh, have kept that era alive and uh, that is where Bob Eastman stayed. Yes, that's Joe that, That's where, yeah, Joe Villeneuve stayed. It's where uh, uh, the, the Bombardier team, the Polaris team, the Arctic Cat team, they all stayed at the Lancaster Motel. They all went back to the Lancaster Motel and, uh, and uh, went into the lounge and had a few drinks with each other after the races was over. And uh, like I've said many times, they, they race handle to handle bar all day long and drink elbow to elbow. Yes. And, uh, you know, and they've been known also to uh, go back to the motel rooms and maybe take an engine off the chassis, take it right in the, in the room and, yeah. and rebuild it for the next day too. So sure. the place is loaded with history of, uh, of the snowmobile. Yeah, and they used to do the award ceremony right, ceremony right there. Was, yep. Give out the trophies right there in the lobby. Yep, that was the, actually the headquarters. Yep. of the Grand Prix. Right and there. if someone is thinking about doing some eastern trail riding and combining history with some trail riding, you're staying at one of the most historic places. Yep. You're riding on the trails created by the first snowmobile club in America. Yep. Many of those legacy trails still exist. Yep. Still exist, yep. Yep. yeah. And then, of course, you're a short walk from Crane Snowmobile Museum. Yeah. Um, it's by appointment only, so once you book your room, you want to call Crane Snowmobile Museum and make a time, yep. make an appointment to yep. go, Just go by there. Just two away and you're yep. there. Yep. So if you want to combine some eastern trail riding with some amazing history. Yep. Uh, oh, and right behind the motel, of course, is the, the site of where the first ski-doos were imported into the U.S. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yep. loaded with history. The Lancaster the motel, motel, Lancaster itself. And if, if, buildings could, if buildings could see, the motel saw that truck pass by it with the very first bombardier ski to come, out, come into the United States in 1959. Yeah. If someone knew the gravity of what was going on as that truck went by, what that would turn into. Nobody thought a thing about it. <laughs> yeah. Nobody thought a thing about it. It's but crazy. Looking back on it, it's, looking it's, back on it now, it's amazing. Uh, you know, it, it's too bad somebody wasn't there with a camera. Yeah. Uh, you know, filming the event. And, yeah. Uh, drum rolls and the drum yeah. rolls and, and interviews with yeah. Paul Crane and you know, uh, it, uh, it. But uh, it's, it wasn't anything like that. It really wasn't. Yeah. Was, fireworks and fanfare. It's what the heck is this expensive toy you've got here? Right. <laughs> it was like it was nine nine hundred thousand dollars for a yeah for a toy. Yeah. That's what they looked at. You know, I see this little tiny machine here. 
And, uh, and Bob Bob's couldn't sell that sled. That original sled could not be sold that year. Nobody wanted to pay that much money for something like that. Wow. And uh, a guy by the name of uh, David Red Parks yep. came in, and he says to Bob Bottoms, who was the manager of Timberland Machines, he said, tell you what I'll do. He says, I've got a woodlot in east of town, and I'll trade you that woodlot for that contraption. So the only way they got rid of that first sled was trading for a woodlot. <laughs> That's crazy. It's crazy. And uh, later on uh, in 66, Bob Bottoms approached him, and they offered him a, a brand new 10 horse skidoo in the crate uh, in exchange for that first original skidoo. And Tim Melange restored that and he donated it to the uh, New Hampshire Snowmobile Museum down in Allenstown. Yes. So that's uh, still, still the first skidoo in the United States. This is still again New Hampshire and it's in Allenstown. Is that what Bob Bottoms was thinking at the time, the, the historic possibility with this? He, that it's he, important he was, to have that first one to. He was a far thinker. That's amazing. Yeah, the, the, minute, the, he saw, yeah the, the minute he saw that sled being ridden up in Falcourt by Paul Crane. Uh, Bob Adair was looking at that originally as, uh, as something for uh, trappers, large logging operations, and uh, uh, you know, so instead of having dog sleds, the trappers could use these little snowmobiles and, and go run trap lines with them. Bob Bottom saw uh, uh, a recreational yeah. boom, and it did. It did exactly that. The you boom exploded, it. It exploded all over the snow belt. Yes, they and there was shrapnel up. everywhere. <laughs> Timberland was selling over ten thousand snowmobiles out of this little small town uh, in the mid sixties. Early 70s, they had to build a whole new building up at the head of Main Street, and, and I don't yeah. know if you guys saw that little clip Mike and I did here a while ago, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it was a crazy time. But uh, anyway, the people that uh, that raced them, and uh, well, the their names were on every Monday morning newspaper in the snow belt. That was big news. Uh, big news. They've they've got their own Hall of Fame now. So yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, cool. That's All right, Mike. Thanks for doing this for us. And, uh, we'll see you on the podcast. Sounds good. Thank so you. So we've got Mike LaPierre, folks, a guy that helps us out more than just about anybody. Go ahead, Mike. Mike. Yes, we've got this time capsule DVD. This was a summer project for Midge and I. We had a, an awful lot of fun making it. Uh, and Midge's cousin was able to come up with some 8 millimeter footage from back in the day. Uh, so Midge and I were talking, well, how can we put this into some kind of a presentation that people would enjoy? So what we did is we came up with uh, doing it as a, uh, a talk show format where he and I are talking and we're rolling the footage and anytime there was something or someone that we knew something about, we would freeze the, the frame and talk that person up or talk that situation up, whatever information we had about them, uh, we would talk that up. And we went for almost two hours like that yeah. uh, and just freezing the frame. There's a lot of people that we knew uh, that from back in the day to talk up. There was plenty of opportunities to talk people up, situations up. And by the way, this is footage from the Lancaster Grand Prix in 1971 and racing in Malone, New York in 1973. Yeah. So we've got this into almost two hours of, there literally is a time capsule uh, from snowmobile racing back in the heyday in yeah. the early 70s. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of fun making it and I think you'll have a lot of fun viewing it. It's great. I think it's the best one we've done, one of the best we've done. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And what I'm doing to sweeten the deal, so to speak, is if you can place the order, the information's in the description of the, this video, I'm going to sweeten it with some extra DVDs. So this is an extra DVD here. This is three episodes of the Vintage Snowmobile podcast from the 21-22 season. And then to sweeten it further, this is another DVD, uh, three more episodes from the 22-23 season. So there's Three, at least three hours of vintage snowmobile programming on each of these discs, plus two hours on this. So this is what eight hours yeah. of vintage snowmobile programming. And I'm going to sound like the Ginsu guy and say, "But wait, there's but more. Wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more." Yeah. No, we also do a, a muscle car podcast, and we've got three episodes of the muscle car podcast on this DVD uh, from the previous season. There's another three hours, so that's eight plus three. That's eleven hours of programming. Yeah. Nine, nine hours, uh, no, eight hours of vintage snowmobile programming, another three hours of muscle car programming, all for $15 plus five to ship. So $20 gets you this care package from these gentlemen you're looking at right here. Um, and it's a wonderful way to support the Hall yeah, of Fame. It, it helps support this, folks. Yes. It also supports Crane Snowmobile Museum and the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast. So if yeah. you enjoy any or all of these things, it's a wonderful way to support us. The funds we generate with this are divided three ways between those those entities, the Hall yeah. of Fame, Crane Snowmobile Museum, and the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast. Yeah. 
Uh, and I hope you will uh, decide to let me to pick up one of these. Yeah. Plus the bonus DVDs. That's what eleven hours of yeah programming. That'll keep you busy on your DVD player for quite a while. Yeah. You'll you wear a rainy day in your couch. or cold, to, you know, thirty below zero or something like that. Someday you could Absolutely. sit down and watch them, and you uh, can wear a groove in your couch binge watching. Yeah, yeah. All of these yeah. episodes. Yeah. And it'll be worth it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, thank you, thank you in advance for your support on this. Yeah, yeah. And the address of where to mail a check is in the description, and we thank you so much for your support. Cool. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, sure. folks. This is morning for us here. Uh, you're in uh, Ben Rosebrook house in the kitchen with Mike LaPierre who's our cameraman today and by the way uh, the Vintage Snowmobile Lovers is the official uh, media outlet for the Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame and always has been so and uh, he, he was down for the going away party for NBR Racing at the motel last night so he came up this morning and uh, we thought it'd be kind of neat to maybe show you folks how we put these plaques together and uh, we've done about, I've done about, uh, well, there's over 30 on the wall right now, so I've done over 60, maybe 60, mid, middle 60 of them. And uh, so it, uh, it's quite a little process, and uh, so I thought I'd show you people, and if you're doing big frame pictures and things like that, might give you some ideas on how to do it, because, you know, what happens is when you get something real big, uh, uh, after a while, the, uh, the photo will wrinkle, and uh, you, you look a little kind of wavy if the light hits it just right. So, and that happened to me on our first plaques, because I didn't know what I was doing, basically. So, uh, I'll show you some uh, the processes of how we do this. Is uh, I, I get some uh, cardboard, and you can get it in big sections at the dollar store, and sometimes they come in 11 by 14 sections, which is kind of cool, because you have to cut them down if they're big. But uh, this came out of a big section, and I cut out a whole bunch of them, so that I'd have them on hand. And what we do, when we have a photo, on, uh, on photo paper, I, I take this special spray adhesive, it's made special for hobbies and things like that, for paper, spraying paper. And what I do is I take this, and I'm not going to do it in here, but i just show you what I do. I just shake it up, and then I go outside, and I spray that cardboard in pretty good shape. Not, not a lot, but just mist it on. And then I come back in here, and I've usually got newspapers out, so I don't get any on the counter. And I lay that down there like that. And then I and then I take the photo, and I, I also make these slightly bigger than than the photo, and uh, because this way here, if, if it's a, if it's a little bit off, you still have the cardboard behind it, uh, because once that touches that cardboard, that's just not going anywhere. So I'll stick that down like that on the edge. And then I take this roller, and I roll it out. I roll it out like that, and back and forth a few times. And that's stuck to that cardboard so that when that goes inside the frame, you won't get that wrinkle effect after a while. It kind of holds it straight. Now, some people use uh, styrofoam, which is a little thicker, but styrofoam uh, is a little too thick for these type of frames, the way these are designed on the back. So uh, this, this seems to work good for me. So I'll just show you that's what I do uh, when I'm getting ready to put them in the frame. Then I set it aside and uh, let it dry. And then take some scissors and I trim the edges so that uh, when I get them in here, it fits perfectly. So these, uh, and then here's another thing too. Uh, you've probably heard me maybe when, when we uh, have our inductions and stuff talking about how tough it is to get photos and things from some of these guys. Uh, they didn't have a lot of really decent photos taken of them. Uh, the best ones, I think, were probably from Timberland Machines. Bob Bottoms always made sure that uh, his Timberland Machines team have professionally done photos at the beginning of every year. They were holding the helmets and they got their suits on or they're standing beside the sled and stuff like that. There's very few teams that ever uh, went that far. So good, real good photos is far and few between. Um, just stay, case in point, uh, our uh, 20, what did, when did we do George Gordon, 2020? I think so. Uh, 20, uh, George Gordon, who was inducted a few years ago, this is, this is the photo. Uh, when he sent you when, you, when he sent his resume, that's the only good photo that we had that, that I could get out of his resume. That's the size of it. I mean, it's it's like a big postage stamp. So you, you end up uh, using up a lot of photo paper 
because you have to you have to enlarge it from just keep doing in steps, and uh, you end up with one like that, and eventually you wind up with that wow. in order to fit the plaque. And uh, <clears throat> when I saw that, because this is coming out of a magazine, so it's the, it, the the photo has all those little dots in it. You know, like they do when they put them in newspapers and magazines. Yeah. It's a whole series of little dots closer together. And some of so the more I enlarged that, the more those little dots showed. And you know what? This is probably one of my favorite photos because it looks like pen and ink. Yes. You know? Yeah. It, uh, it, it absolutely is, it is one of the better ones, I think. And uh, so anyway, that's George Gordon, and that's, that's how I did it. And uh, here's another one of Ronnie Hall. Uh, his photo was taken with his team, and when I wanted to do Ronnie, I, I wanted to individualize, just, you know, just go down to Ron, so I cut out uh, most of the other section for that, and then I enlarged it to this, I enlarged it to that, and then I went from that to the 8x10 to fit the frame. So this is the process we have to go through on a lot of these things, and uh, just to give you a perspective on we spent quite a lot of time trying to get these things uh, to look right. And another thing, too, uh, we have this uh, member of our uh, Eastern Snowmobile uh, Hall of Fame page right now that he joined uh, maybe a year ago or so is uh, Michael Maggie Hoyt. And uh, I don't know if it's Mike or Maggie that's doing these, but uh, that's his uh, Facebook handle. is Michael Maggie Hoyt, Michael Slash. And uh, he does very well with touching up these photos very well and uh, so I'll send him a photo and he'll doctor it up and, and make it look really really good so uh, we really uh, appreciate their work for helping us get these plaques ready. Alright I'm going to start uh, by pulling these two frames apart. They always ship them uh, with two frames together uh, glass to glass. I'm, I'm sure it's probably just so that the glass won't break uh, while they're being shipped. So, And they also I put cardboard in the corners, which helps support them too. And you just have to peel this plastic off. Alright, there's the frame. That's how we get them. It's just like that. And, uh, I pull the corners off. tabs bend up kind of tough and my fingernails I don't have really good fingernails so I really can't get under them that well so what I do is I just use my jackknife to, to grab them pick them up flip them out we searched and searched for uh, double 8 by 10 frames uh, online and uh, this was the best setup that we found they, uh, they're really consistent in the size of the frames and everything. So they've been, they've been working pretty well for us. And here's the backing. It's just a piece of cardboard. Uh, and then here's the mat. That's the mat right there. And what I do is I take these photos and their resumes right inside of these mats. And I do it like this. Uh, But uh, again, uh, even on their resumes, I glue them to that cardboard backing just like I do the photos, so, so they're good and stiff. And uh, so then we put this under here like this. And get it straight, get it even. I do these all by eyesight. Um, I, don't, I don't measure. And you get it about as close as you can get it. And that looks pretty good there. So then I slide it over to the edge. And uh, Scotch tape is the best as far as I can see. Uh, the brand name Scotch is, uh, is always better than, than some of the off-brand tapes. So we always go with that if we can. Okay, I'll take that. All right, so that's taped. Then I pick it up like this. I fold it over. this side. Then I look at it again to make sure it's straight. Looks pretty 
straight. So then I continue taping it. I'm going to tape it in the middle on this side. Let's tape it here. And then I tape the corners. Keeps it nice and flush against the mat once it's inside the frame. And once it's inside the frame, uh, probably don't even need tape because it's nice and tight inside that cardboard, but this tape is what keeps it uh, straight and even. Okay. To the photo. And the photo is done the same way. Sometimes, like right now, I'm going to have to cut it. Oh, yeah. So I flip it over. And I'll take. I have to cut a little bit of the bottom off. So I'll give room for the tape. Again, I line it up. Get it as straight as possible here. This is a great photo, by the way, and the reason is uh, the person that that sent me all of this stuff is actually a professional photographer hmm. and a very good one. That helps. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll introduce you to to this one at some point when I get done here. But this is very tedious work to get this straight. No, you can't rush that. Just take oh, your time. Yeah. yeah. Make sure. Right. You can't, you know, cut the heads off. And <laughs> okay, I think that's Let me look at it to make sure that it isn't moved. Okay, that looks good. So now we finish taping it. Do uh, two two each of these. Yeah. One, well, one, for the, one for the inductee and one for the wall. One for the wall. Yeah. So. The wall of fame for the hall the of wall fame. Wall of fame. For the hall of fame. That's right. And uh, these frames, uh, although they're not super expensive, they are they are pricey when you buy ten. Hmm. So uh, and thanks to people that come to our inductions and, and the people that buy our t-shirts uh, are the ones that buy these frames. Because that's where we get our money from, basically, is to is through t-shirt sales. So We appreciate uh, people helping us out. Okay, now I've, I've got this in and 
what you do is you look at it very closely for any kind of dirt, any hair or anything like that. A little speck of dirt shows right up on this white. Mm. So you really have to make sure that there's no lint or anything. So I look that all over. And that looks pretty good. And then I take this Norwex cloth and I go over the glass. Get any smudges that might be on that. Just wipe that down. This works very good on glass. It shines it right up. It takes any smudges out and uh, great stuff. Then I hold it up to the light. Get the light to reflect off it. So you can see, see if there's any smudges. Also be on the other side. Okay, that's about as good as I can get it, I guess. And then I introduce this to the frame, and before I do anything else, I flip it over again and I uh, examine it. As I have in the past rushed things and put them inside the frame and put the cardboard all on them and bent the tabs all down and then I flip it over and there's a speck of dirt right in there. Oh, yeah. I ain't got to take it all apart again. So, <laughs> the best thing to do... Yeah, take your time and do it right the first time. And make sure it's clean. Yeah. And now it's ready for the cardboard. And what I do is I even just bend maybe four of these over and then I look at it again. And it looks pretty darn good. So uh, I also take the edge of my knife and kind of kind of squeeze them into the cardboard. Keep it nice and tight. this thing uh, folks is uh, through our DVD sales and uh, Mike has a, uh, a set of uh, DVDs from each induction that we've done since 2017 this for sale for like 60 bucks which is really worth it because you've got all of these guys that are on the wall right now in DVDs forever and uh, we're going to wrap this uh, frame up here this uh, this little tab is a uh, is what hooks it onto the wall and uh, I'm not going to install it right now, but what I do is I, I measure center of the frame and then I get this right in the center. And uh, you take a little hammer and you just tap each side of that to, to drive it into the wood. You get a close up on that. Yeah, they work pretty darn yeah, good. Put that down there again if you would, where you had it. Yeah. There we go. And you yeah. just tap that down with a hammer tap and that down. it goes into the wood. These frames are quite light. So that's, that's uh, the fun fact, this is what we use when we put them on the wall at the museum. This is all we've ever used. And what's nice about this is versus, you know, the uh, the little hooks with the cable yeah. that runs across like that. Uh, you can you can use that, but the problem is, is with that, it, it, uh, the length of it can be off, you know, a quarter inch or half inch on your cable. So in order to put them on the wall and have them all look even all the way across, it would be very difficult to do that with a cable. Yeah. So it's a constant uh, battle to keep that straight. Yeah. But these little things here. If you put them all in the same place, so that when you put them on the hook for the wall, uh, chances are you don't have to fidget to get the right height and, and everything like that. So centers that works a lot easier. Good. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna nail that on. So we've got Mike Lapierre, folks, a guy that helps us out more than just about anybody. Go ahead, Mike. Yes, we've got this time capsule DVD. This was a summer project for Midge and I. We had an awful lot of fun making it. Uh, and Midge's cousin was able to come up with some 8 millimeter footage from back in the day. Uh, so Midge and I were talking, well, how can we put this into some kind of a presentation that people would enjoy? So what we did is we came up with uh, doing it as a, uh, a talk show format where he and I are talking and we're rolling the footage. And anytime there was something or someone 
that we knew something about, we would freeze the, the frame and talk that person up or talk that situation up, whatever information we had about them, uh, we would talk that up. And we went for almost two hours like that yeah. uh, and just freezing the frame. There's a lot of people that we knew uh, that from back in the day to talk up. There was plenty of opportunities to talk people up, situations up. And by the way, this is footage from the Lancaster Grand Prix in 1971 and racing in Malone, New York in 1973. Yeah. So we've got this into almost two hours of, there literally is a time capsule uh, from snowmobile racing back in the heyday in the early 70s. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of fun making it, and I think you'll have a lot of fun viewing it. It's great. I think it's the best one we've done, one of the best we've done. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And what I'm doing to sweeten the deal, so to speak, is if you can place the order, the information's in the description of the, this video, I'm going to sweeten it with some extra DVDs. So this is an extra DVD here. This is three episodes of the Vintage Snowmobile podcast from the 21-22 season. And then to sweeten it further, this is another DVD, uh, three more episodes from the 22-23 season. So there's three, at least three hours of Vintage Snowmobile programming on each of these discs, plus two hours on this. So this is what's eight hours yeah. of Vintage Snowmobile programming. And I'm going to sound like the Ginsu guy, and say, but wait, there's but more. wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more. Yeah. No, we also do a, a muscle car podcast. And we've got three episodes of the muscle car podcast on this DVD uh, from the previous season. There's another three hours. So that's eight plus three. That's 11 hours of programming. Yeah. Nine, nine hours, uh, no, eight hours of vintage snowmobile programming. Another three hours of muscle car programming. All for $15 plus five to ship. So $20 get you this care package from these gentlemen you're looking at right here. Um, and it's a wonderful way to support the Hall yeah, of Fame. It, it helps support this, folks. Yes. It also supports Crane Snowmobile Museum and the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast. So if yeah. you enjoy any or all of these things, it's a wonderful way to support us. The funds we generate with this are divided three ways between those those entities, the Hall yeah. of Fame, Crane Snowmobile Museum, and the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast. Yeah. Uh, and I hope you will uh, decide to... Let me, to pick up one of these, yeah. Plus the bonus DVDs. That's what eleven hours of yeah programming. That'll keep you busy on your DVD player for quite a while. Yeah, you'll you'll wear a rainy day in your couch. or cold, <laughs> to, you know, thirty below zero or something like that. Someday you could Absolutely. sit down and watch them, and you uh, can wear a groove in your couch binge watching. Yeah, yeah. All of these yeah. episodes. Yeah, and it'll be worth it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, thank you thank you in advance for your support on this. Yeah, yeah. And the address of where to mail a check is in the description, and we thank you so much for your support.